How many of you personally wrote, not emailed, but wrote a letter to any politician on a, an issue that was important to you? Okay, we've got some. In the last 12 months, how many of you actually met with a politician over an issue that was important? Oh, a little less. Um, in the last 12 months, how many of you attended at a, a rally or a political protest? Ooh, wow, none. Nobody here even attended the Occupy movement? Okay, we got one. So um, I actually, I don't know what you think of the Occupy movement, but I really, it really resonated with me. You know, I watched people being interviewed basically from around the world, and some people were there. They couldn't even articulate exactly what it was that was bugging them, but they just felt things were off the rails, things were kind of going sideways. And they wanted, basically, to be present. They wanted to be counted. Just being there was what the protest was. And it kind of resonated with me because it implied actions. Um, I want to ask you a, uh, another question. Please don't answer. I don't want you to, to verbalize. I don't want you to raise your hand. And actually, I'm going to ask the question. And then you know we all have an ego that presents to ourselves an image so we can live with ourselves. Your ego will say that this question doesn't apply to you. I promise you that's going to happen. I'm going to ask the question, you know, oh yeah, that doesn't apply to me. Now, by the end of the lecture, though, I think you'll be willing to consider that the question does apply to you. And the question that your ego is going to reject is, why? Why do you personally love slavery? You see how you, you're rejecting that in your mind. Well, I don't love slavery, your ego is saying. But you know, um, regardless of what we tell ourselves, regardless of what we tell others, what we care about is lived out through what we do, through our actions. You know, if, you're, if you love your family, you spend time with your family. If you love music, you become a musician, you become involved. If you love freedom... As freedoms are being taken away, you become active. But if you love slavery, when freedoms are being taken away, what do you do? Nothing. You're apathetic. You, uh, you sit around. <clears throat> we are in a um, very unusual period of history. Governments are, are taking away our rights on many fronts in a way that, that I think even 10 years ago most of us wouldn't believe is possible. And one of the examples that I like right now is the smart meter example. Because it has a really interesting philosophical implication that, that many of us don't think about. And let's just assume, I'm not here to lecture about whether they're safe or not safe, but let's assume that science, the, the evidence of whether smart meters are safe, let's say it's inconclusive right now, just for argument's sake. I mean, I don't believe it is inconclusive. But... Um, I will share with you, whenever there's a technology that may be dangerous, there's a pattern that the industry goes through to protect the technology. And I'll just share it with you, and that you'll see it played out throughout your life. Whenever there's independent research that suggests something's dangerous, and it becomes to the media's attention, what happens is, is the industry will hold a press conference. And they'll say, look at this research. It says that what we're doing is dangerous. The industry, they never hide from the research. They say, look at this. It's dangerous. Or there's a suggestion it's dangerous. We, the industry, are so concerned about this that we're actually going to put a whole bunch of money up for research because we need to find out if this is true or not. You know, one or two studies, you can't rely on that. And so then the industry will fund a whole bunch of industry research, which will be inconclusive. And then the regulatory body, I mean, what are they to do? And we've seen it, you know, you see it in smoking and breast implants, asbestos. Now we're into it in smart meters. I mean, it's interesting, 80%, I'll ask, answer questions at the end. 80% of the independent research on smart meters show they're dangerous. But <clears throat> what I find interesting about smart meters is that it's involuntary. Where I live, we're getting three. We're getting water ones gas ones, and we're getting electric ones. So far, we've just gotten two. Um, <clears throat> but I got a call from a lady, and now I've 
developed a, a friendship with her named Louise. And Louise is in her 70s, but prior to the smart meter, she was very healthy, very active. I mean, despite her age, she played tennis about three times a week. And she was, you know, walking, gardening, the whole thing. The day the smart meters went in, she became disabled, the very day. And the city took her meter out uh, within a week because she was just suffering so much. Didn't make any difference. And I've seen that pattern, actually, when people get sick and their meter's out. You know, it doesn't matter. As long as the neighborhood's covered, they stay sick. But what was interesting about Louise is not just that she was becoming physically disabled, but emotionally, she felt betrayed by her government because it was actually her house that was making her sick. It had been a family home for decades. It was where she went to escape problems in the world. I mean, our homes are supposed to be very safe places. And she could not get over the fact that it was the government imposing this on her. See, usually when we're exposed to a risk, I mean, smoking, asbestos, whatever it is, the government tries to take steps so that if you are concerned, you can avoid the risk. But what's new about this smart meter thing is it's the government imposing the risk on us. I mean, there's really no escape, is there, if you live in a city, unless you're really rich and you can leave. So um, philosophically, it's really, really interesting. Now, <clears throat> let me switch to another example that I just find fascinating because it's, like, the government's become so extreme about it. But just to illustrate how they're taking control over our bodies and our health, and it's the raw milk example. I just love it. Because really, you can make a case that raw milk carries a risk, but it's not something that most of us are afraid of. And is everyone here aware that raw milk, is, it's illegal to sell in Canada? Basically every province. And so people who want raw milk, what they do is they get together and they form a co-op. So they get together and they buy a cow or two and then they're sharing the milk of the herd they own and they, you know, the thinking is, is well that way we can get around this buying and selling. <clears throat> the governments in different provinces over the last year and a half have become very aggressive in shutting down these Rama co-ops. And the worst one is, uh, it happened in Alberta, Eric and Judith, they had a little two uh, cow herd in Wildwood, Alberta. And the inspector started showing up and telling them, stop and trying to seize milk and equipment. Uh, and they wouldn't stop. And so then Judith is dropping off some milk at one of the, the owners. She's in her, you know, the, a private driveway. And two inspectors show up to come onto the private property. And they demand the milk. She's not going to give them the milk. So she uh, gets back in the driver's seat, starts to close the door. They stop her from closing the door. And then they physically drag her out of the van. And they subdue her. And then once she's subdued, they take the milk out of the van. Now, about a month later, uh, what happened was what I call the Great Canadian Raw Milk Takedown. Because I think it was a sting. Is somebody had phoned them and they want to join the co-op and they're all excited. And so she arranges to meet this person in town. It's happened on October 25th, not this last October, but the October before. And uh, so she's meeting this person at 7.30 at night. End of October, it's dark. And the guy won't sign the contract. And she thought, this is kind of odd because he was so excited about joining. And then two inspectors show up to seize the milk that she had. If the guy joined, then he can start sharing in the milk. Which is why I think it was a sting because, A, how would the inspectors know where she would be, and what are they doing working at 7.30? So, you know, really then have three inspectors working at night. And then it was kind of a repeat of the first time she gets back into the driver's seat, they won't let her close the door, and they start trying to physically drag her out of, out of the van. Um, but there was a bit of a wrinkle this time, is she saw somebody walking down the street and she started screaming for help. And so they stopped. They wouldn't let her close the door but at least they weren't trying to physically pull her out of the, the van. And this is actually helpful for you to know. So I guess state agents, they're okay dragging farm wives out of vehicles when they're not being watched. But don't you know, I guess they don't like doing it when there's an audience. So that's good to know. So once they stopped trying to drag her out of the van, her attention turned to her four-year-old daughter who's in the back seat freaking out. 
Because you can imagine a four-year-old kid, it's dark. There's some strange man trying to drag your mother out of the vehicle. Um, so she gets her daughter into a nearby house. And just like, can you watch my daughter for a sec? Um, you should know at the end of this, when all of this was over, she had to take her daughter to the hospital because the daughter wouldn't calm down. So, I mean, and you can just imagine. I mean, what are you going to do when you're a four-year-old, right? So she gets out of this house, and she explained to me, she says, I'm just a wreck emotionally. You know how sometimes you just, there's, it's too much and you're almost shaking. So she goes in, there's a church right there. She goes in and she's just trying to calm down. And the people in the church say, no, you, you have to go outside. The police are there now. So she goes outside. The police cars have boxed in her van, one in the front, one in the back. The emergency light's going. And she said it looked like a, a cocaine bust all over raw milk. And with the police there, the health inspectors were able to get the milk and you know, go away confident that they have protected us from the dangers of raw milk. Now, can you imagine being dragged out of your vehicle over you know, what you're wanting to eat? See, because what's the difference about somebody who's delivering that stuff to you being dragged out of your vehicle? The state is actually willing to physically drag people out of vehicles to prevent us from eating something that we're choosing to eat. You know, the, the Michael Smith case, it's, it's really the same thing. You guys are all aware of who Michael Smith is. He's very famous in Ontario because he runs a raw milk co-op here and he's charged and he goes to trial and the judge looks at all the evidence and at the trial level, the judge said, I actually think, you know, you're not selling here. I, I don't think you're breaking the law. And the judge went on and spoke about how choosing what we eat is of fundamental importance. Like it was just, for anyone who read the decision, it was just wonderful. So here you've got an Ontario court saying, choosing what you, you want to eat is of fundamental importance. Now the province of Ontario could have left that alone, but your government wasn't happy with the court decision letting this raw milk cooperative survive and saying that you know, choosing what we want to eat is of fundamental importance. So they appeal, and it actually it says something that they appealed. And the appeal court did a really interesting thing. Mr. Smith at the appeal was also arguing that you know, people have a constitutional right to choose what they're going to eat. And he, was, he had brought in evidence of you know, some of the cow share people and why they were choosing raw milk, and you know, some had health issues, the whole thing. And uh, at the appeal level, the court said, Mr. Schmidt, uh, yes, you've got all this body of evidence here, but you don't have standing, it's a legal term, I'll explain it in a second, you don't have standing to bring this evidence, so I'm going to take this evidence, I'm going to move it, it's a, I'm going to exclude it, it's behind me, I don't see it. Boy, the sun's shining over here and the birds are singing, I don't see any charter violation here. Oh, by the way, you're guilty. And... Uh, actually found in paragraph 96 of the decision that the charter does not give people the right to drink raw milk. So we've gone from a decision saying, well, it's fundamental importance to decide what we're going to eat, but your government actually argued that we don't have a constitutional right to choose to drink raw milk, and you could add any food you want. It's the same principle, isn't it? Which is very interesting. Why would your government argue that you shouldn't have that right? And the standing issue is fascinating. And, and basically what standing means is it just means you have the right to stand in front of the court and, and you know, argue what you want to argue or, or bring the evidence in that you want to bring in. And the standing has become now a weapon to actually prevent us from arguing things in front of the court. I'm going to share one that I was involved with just in a second um, because it actually has an impact on you. So you need to, to hear about it. But this standing thing has become basically a way of shutting the courts off to us. And that's very dangerous because if we can't settle our disputes with the government in the court, then we no longer have rule of law. We no longer have review of government. And, I mean, things are actually even worse than just the courts. I mean, the government itself, both in the U.S. and Canada, have been passing laws which basically take their activity outside of court supervision, okay? 
And, and we always have to, if we don't have the court supervising what the government is doing, then we no longer have rule of law. I mean, if you want to pull out a dictionary and look at the definition of tyranny, all tyranny is is the ability of the government to act without, with its own discretion. It's not being supervised. That's what tyranny is. That's why revolutions are fought to establish the rule of law and why it's so important to have independent courts. But our governments have been passing laws that basically take their action outside of court review. I mean, the worst ones are in the United States. And I know we'll always go, well, we're different. We're Canadians. But, um, and they've definitely gone farther than us. There's no question. But it's dangerous for us to think we're different. And I'll cite you know, some Canadian examples, which maybe aren't as bad, but it's the same trajectory. But I mean, in the United States, how about <coughs> this you know, right that the executive has taken on itself? They've actually, you know, it's all in writing. They've passed law that allows a committee, a secret committee to meet and decide whether or not you're an enemy of the state. And if you are, they can, they'll issue death warrants. And why it got big press in the United States is, is they can issue death warrants against their own citizens. And the first citizen that they killed under this law was Anwar al-Awlaki. And so it was in the news. I mean, Americans are a little upset about it. But can you imagine, you know, a committee meeting, you're not told they're meeting, to try and determine whether or not they should issue a death warrant for you. And you're not given the opportunity to show up and say, well, you're saying I should be killed because of this and this, but you're wrong and here's why. Like, do you see how dangerous that is? This is a star chamber. We're back to a star chamber, at least south of the border, <clears throat> where a government committee can meet, issue an order to kill you, and you're not even told. And to go further, the law there actually says that a lawyer can't represent you when you're on the list. See, the American Civil Liberties Union was trying to get permission. You have to ask the government for permission. It's a criminal offense, and you can be sued civilly if you act for somebody on this list without the government's permission. And the, uh, the uh, Civil Liberties Association in the United States was trying to get the government's permission to act for this guy after they found out a warrant had, death warrant had been issued, but the guy was killed before that was heard. Now, what's up with the government making it illegal for a lawyer to even represent you when you've been sentenced to death with, in secret? Isn't, is there something wrong with this? Am I, am I kind of overstating, you know, we're kind of losing our rights? That we're, they're supposed to be a liberal democracy. We're supposed to be a liberal democracy. You know, in December, Obama signed into law that, that big new gargantuan act that will allow the armed forces to basically detain people indefinitely. They don't have to take you to court. It's legal now for them to, you can be picked up on the street there and they can ship you out of the country and they're not violating the law. I mean, how can that be? So, <clears throat> it's happening. Governments are becoming adversarial in taking control over our bodies. And I, as I say, I, as Canadians, we want to say, well, it's a little different here. I think Mehar Arar might think differently. And what about the Consumer Product Safety Act we passed last year? Uh, are you guys familiar with that? That act, it's, um, it was touted to be for our safety, and hence it's called the Consumer Product Safety Act. And what it does, doesn't allow them to imprison or kill you without involving the courts, but if you are involved with consumer products at all, so whether you manufacture them, whether you distribute them, you know, you could be a trucker that just drives them around to stores, whether you're a retail store, under this act, they can basically take control over your business, take control of your bank accounts, your property. They can destroy you financially and you'll never, never go to court. You don't have to have committed an offense or anything. They can walk in and basically tell you what you need to do with your business and there doesn't even have to be a safety concern. <coughs> Absolute tyranny. And it, sure, this isn't a life or death thing, but you know, if the government comes in and destroys your livelihood and your, your kids are on the street without ever seeing the inside of a courtroom without ever seeing the whites of a judge's eyes, there's a problem. And <clears throat> the government had tried to pass a law that would give them the same power to take away our foods and drugs. So basically destroy anyone who was making a product that they didn't want. 
and that was Bill C-51. Does anyone remember that bill? That's, I mean, one of the, the successful examples of people like you resisting the government. Now, I want to get back to this standing thing. Just a, a recent example. Um, I told you about Michael Schmidt. The standing is a problem in the United States, too. It's not just here. An example comes to mind very quickly. Uh, you guys know who Jesse Ventura is. He was governor of Minnesota. He was a wrestler for a while. Um, but he's a, a really passionate person on fighting for rights. And he was getting tired of being groped at the airport. You know how they... Yeah, and they don't give you flowers. They don't give you chocolates. I've been groped. It's just been offensive. And he was, you know, he had had a couple of occasions where he had just, the groping had gone too far. So he goes to federal court and he says, look it, I'm getting groped. Surely to goodness this is violating my constitutional rights. And the court threw him out. He said, Mr. Ventura, you don't have standing. You don't have the right to come before me and argue that that's unconstitutional. Same thing just happened to uh, us in the True, True Hope case. Uh, any, everyone here familiar with True Hope? I've spoken about them. I, I'm not here to give their story. I want to talk about what happened in the federal court. But for those of you who aren't familiar with True Hope, they developed a vitamin and mineral supplement to treat bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder. And they, um, about mid-2002, Health Canada shut down, uh, the government of Alberta was funding a double-blind clinical trial with taxpayer money on the product because the earlier research had been promising, and then told this company, you have to stop selling. And True Hope said to the government, and I paraphrase, are you mad? They said, we are treating, at that time it was about a thousand Canadians, they treat people from all over the world, but at that time for Canadians, it was a thousand Canadians who have serious mental illness, like these are the people that were in psych wards and had no life and doesn't work for everyone, but if it works, you're normal. And so we've taken them, they're normal, and you're t telling us we're to take that away and have them go back to being sick. He says, there's going to be suicides. There's going to be hospitalizations. Health Canada, we can't do that. And so people wrote letters to Health Canada. There were hundreds of letters sent where people said, look it, Here's my problem, and I've been on this drug and that drug, and nothing worked. I get on EMPR Plus, it works. Psychiatrists wrote, doctors wrote, people met with, you know, Health Canada people. There were, you know, phone calls. Health Canada ignored it all. And then, <clears throat> uh, because the company wouldn't stop selling, the, the Achilles heel was, it's a Canadian company, but the product's made in the United States and then shipped across the border. So because they wouldn't stop selling, Health Canada seized a couple of shipments and then started telling customs to turn shipments away. Now, <clears throat> I'm of the personal opinion that this actually caused deaths. And in the court, I invited the court to find, that, as a matter of fact, that Health Canada caused deaths. We had, um, you know, there were a whole bunch of people who, you know, told the court their story and you know, if I was going to run out, I actually had a suicide plan in place because I wasn't willing to go back to that. Can you actually be, imagine having been so ill that you would, while you're still sane, put a suicide plan in place? We had uh, the head of the Alberta branch of the Canadian Mental Health Association, Ron Lachiness, when all of this was happening, he started holding press conferences warning Health Canada, you know, you're going to cause suicides. And then he started holding press conferences about the suicides of Canadian Mental Health Association members who had committed suicide because they couldn't get any power plus. He told the court about a funeral he went to. We had, you know, experts saying you couldn't take this product away without causing death. We had Health Canada. There were so many people calling Health Canada that um, they set up what was called a 1-800 crisis line. So if you phone there, even you know, as soon as you said the product name or the company, they'd hit a button and transfer you to this crisis line where they had, they told us trained trained counselors to, uh, you know, help you with you losing access to Empower Plus. Well, these guys took notes. There's almost 800 pages of notes of people pleading for their lives. It, it's difficult to read, absolutely difficult to read. We got all of this evidence in front of the court. Um, 
<clears throat> they were charged criminally, and the criminal court looked at all of this evidence and, and said to Health Canada, and I paraphrase, are you mad? It was legally necessary for True Hope to ignore you. And they threw the case out. The criminal court said it was legally necessary that if you'd listened to Health Canada, there would have been harm. Threw their case out. Now, True Hope had started a federal court action when this product was seized. And the whole point of it was to prevent this from happening again. And <clears throat> what we were arguing in federal court was that the seizure power they used to seize the product was unconstitutional. And what we were trying to get the court to agree was that when the state seizes vital medication, okay, so in a circumstance like this where they've had lots of notice, this is vital. When they seize vital medication, the state has to do two things. One, tell you they seized your vital medication. Because they seized these shipments, they didn't tell anyone. So can you imagine, you depend on a product for your life, the government seized it, and they don't tell you. So you, you can't make any alternate arrangements. So we thought actually it was you know, common sense. If you're going to seize something somebody depends on for their life, you better tell them. And they have to have an opportunity to be heard. There has to be some inexpensive, informal process where, you know, a vulnerable person can go to the government who sees something vital and say, I know you're trying to enforce the law here, but I need this for my life and there has to be some balancing. You know, let's say it's a product that, you know, your foot's not itchy. Well, maybe they're not going to give it back. But if your life depends on it, then they should. Do you know what I mean? Like a quick and easy. We thought it would be reasonable in Canada when the government takes something you need for your very life to be told and have an opportunity to be heard. It's just, it's referred to as procedural fairness. So we've got all of this evidence in front of this federal court justice, justice and Mr. Justice Campbell. I'm inviting the court to find that Health Canada actually caused deaths. And uh, there's all this evidence of suffering. And we run into the standing problem. Justice Campbell says, oh yes, you've got all this evidence, but you don't have standing to put it in front of me. So I'm going to take all of this evidence and I'm going to move it all over here. It's behind me now. Now that I've said you don't have standing, I can't even legally remember what it is. The sun is shining over there. Those birds are singing. The flowers are blooming. I do not see a charter violation here. I don't see any need for anyone to be told when vital medication is seized. What's the problem? It all looks good out here. And certainly, your ability to come to federal court and argue for the return of your product, that has to be enough protection for vulnerable people who have just had vital medication see surely to goodness. Now, I think that's a legal farce. I mean, I think it's telling that, you know, out of a thousand people whose lives depended on this product, not a single one started a court action. And surely to goodness, some of them went to lawyers, those with money, and said, what do we do? This case took about seven years to hear. I mean, you have to, and now the government's going after our costs. We'll probably have to pay several hundred thousand dollars to the government for their legal fees. Now, what person can do that? You know, how many of us are rich enough to hire, you know, constitutional lawyers to go to court? And how many of us have the time? My point is, is if you're vulnerable, the courts basically said you don't have any protection. So that was a bit of a farce. So we go up to the Federal Court of Appeal, and we say to the Federal Court of Appeal, um, you know, they should have allowed this evidence in. And the most bizarre thing happened. When you are appealing a decision saying the lower court should not have excluded evidence, you always file the evidence so the court can look at the evidence and you can say, you see how it's relevant? And that's why it should be, you know. Well, the Federal Court of Appeal said, you can't even file the evidence. We don't want it part of the record. We don't want it in our court. None of this. Uh, we're going to do two things. We're going to break the appeal into two parts. The first part is, all we're going to decide is, can you file the evidence? Do you have standing to file the evidence? And then, because you know, it's not filed, we'll have another appeal later on, and you, we can argue about whether the charter was violated. So we show up for the first part, and the court doesn't really decide that, but decides the second part. So the court says, well, we're going to assume that you could have brought the evidence in. It should have just ended there. Okay, fine, file the evidence, and we'll argue. And 
yeah, it probably showed that there were problems. But we agree with the trial judge, there's surely enough protection with being able to go to federal court, and so there's no charter violation. I, I've never felt more railroaded in my life in a court. So, but I just bring it up because we, um, we're losing access to the courts on these issues over the standing issue. And then it's also important for you to know that your government has argued and the courts agreed that you don't have the right to be told that vital medication is being seized and you don't have the right other than going to court for trying to uh, access your drugs. And this is important because we're losing access. We're losing access. What's happened in Canada, for those of you who aren't familiar with the history, these products used to really not be regulated, natural health products. We kind of had chemical drug regulations, but we really didn't regulate natural health products. And so we brought in, in 2004, some new regulations to regulate these. And under our new regulations are a couple of legal presumptions. And one legal presumption is, is these products are presumed to be dangerous. Okay, by law, they're presumed to be dangerous, and they're presumed to be fraudulent. So they're all illegal. Unless anyone does anything, the whole industry is illegal. And, but to be able to stay on the market, you have to apply for a license and overcome this presumption of danger and this presumption that it's fraudulent. Which actually, you know, it sounds wonderful, um, but it's just interesting to give you a contrast. In the United States, the same products, they're called dietary supplements, but they're the same products, are by law, first of all, they're classed as drug, or foods, ours are classed as drugs, and, and in their law, they're presumed to be safe. Exact opposite of us, so it's interesting, isn't it? And under their law, the FDA cannot take a dietary supplement off of the market unless the FDA has evidence of harm. So it's just curious, the two countries, we've chosen to go the exact opposite way. And <clears throat> we are losing, of, of the products where license applications have been filed, we're losing around 50%. So a little more than 50% pass. Um, but there's a whole number of products where people, the manufacturers aren't even trying to get licenses because they know they're not going to or they're too small to be able to afford the process. And then we've literally lost 20 to 30,000 foreign products where they just, they won't ship anymore, primarily from the United States. So we're in the process of losing products. You know, a, a pretty good clip here. And why? Why are we losing these products? Why are we imposing these regulations? And well, we're told it's for our safety. Okay? Well, I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, and you can take this to the bank. We are now in a brave new world. Whenever you hear any level of government talking about your safety, those alarm bells, it's like time to pull the fire alarm in your mind. Full-scale alert, you're in danger, <laughs> right? The worst thing that can happen to you today is the government trying to protect you. But no, we're told we need these regulations for our safety. Now, some of you will know the answer to this. In all of Canadian history, Let's just go back to Confederation in 1867. So 145 years. How many deaths have been caused by a natural health product in Canada? Zero. Zero. And I've done an access to information request. I've asked Health Canada. They can't provide. They just scratch their heads. And they know I make this claim all the time. I, they never dare to correct me. Um, but we know things like peanuts and shellfish, all of that, they cause deaths every year. So just, I mean, just to do a risk comparison, natural health products are really safe, right? I mean, they're, they're quite safe. <clears throat> so why would we bring in regulations then that are going to take away a large number of products for safety? Do you know Health Canada actually never did a risk analysis? Like you would think if you're going to bring in regulations to regulate an industry saying, well, we have safety concerns, you might do a risk analysis to show what the risk is. And you can ask them. They haven't done one. Um, what's the risk of these products so that they would know how to best regulate them? They never did a risk analysis. And what's even worse is, from a safety perspective, we have it absolutely ass backwards. Because, okay, we've got all these products that people are taking that aren't causing deaths. But we haven't asked the next question, okay, we're going to take most of them away. Like we're going to lose 75%. 75 to 80% of the products we'd otherwise have access to when all of this is, is through the wash. So 
can you take away a whole bunch of products that people are using to manage their health and that doesn't cause a health consequence? I mean, just, just think about this, for example. I, and I'll kind of approach this two different ways. So let, let me just give you a personal example. Uh, well, we'll start, we'll go back to the, the true hope thing. I mean, never been a death cause in Canadian history by a natural health product. Health, health Canada takes one off the market for a year. A uh, true hope estimates there was 30 to 50 suicides. Nobody knows because there hasn't been a follow-up. About 300 people disappeared. And nobody's had the resources to do a follow-up. I got a call uh, by a lady named Jerry Madden, and uh, Jerry got breast cancer in 1988. It's her first time she was diagnosed. She had uh, the lump removed with surgery. She was given radiation and was able to go five years before it came back. came back in 1993, and she was going to go through the same thing, you know, surgery and radiation. I don't recall now if they had chemo at that time, you know, as part of the treatment. But she ran into a problem. The surgeon was, going to, was just going on a long holiday. And there was also some trouble scheduling because that caused a backlog of really important surgeries when he got back. So it looked like she was going to be about three months without her surgery. And so she decided, I'm not willing to do nothing during that time. So she went to some naturopathic doctors that specialize in cancer and got put on a protocol while she was waiting for the surgery. Well, she goes through the surgery, and the lumps had gone from being extremely cancerous to benign, and they had shrunk considerably. And she says the surgeon still can't explain what happened. And then she stayed on this protocol, and she went from 1993 all the way to 2008 before the cancer came back. And this time it came back, and she, she said, yeah, I'll do the surgery, but I'm putting the surgery off for a year. And she goes to, back to naturopathic doctors who specialize in cancer and gets on, you know, even a better protocol and has the surgery. Again, the, the tumors had shrunk and, and everything looks good. And she said to me, she says, you know, and first of all, she was calling me because the main product that she believed has kept her alive she can no longer get because the manufacturer in the States will no longer ship to Canada because of our regulations. Okay, just so you know why I'm having the conversation with her. And she says to me, she says, you know, I'm not cured of cancer. Natural health products didn't cure me to can from cancer, but I firmly believe I'm alive because of them. She says, when I was diagnosed in 1988, so 24 years ago, she says, like, you're not a woman, but it it's just something that, that hammers you. It's like now you're super sensitive about your breasts and staying alive. And anyone who gets breast cancer around you, you pay attention. Like you become very alive to breast cancer once you have breast cancer, she said. She says, I have gone to funeral after funeral after funeral of friends and acquaintances and family members who all after me have gotten breast cancer. They just went and got the regular treatments. They're all dead, everyone. She says, I don't know anyone who's lived as long as me. She says, I don't know anyone. I've been looking for 24 years. I've been paying attention because I'm sensitive to it. I don't know a single person who has lived longer than me with breast cancer. She says, why have they taken that product away from me? It's a question I can't answer, except, you know, why is because what we're doing is causing harm. That's why. And, you know, the media likes to bait me. One of the favorite questions, because, you know, I pose the regulations. I dare to say, Maybe what we're doing is causing more harm than good. Well, how can the government try to, trying to protect us possibly be bad, right? And one of the questions where, you know, people try to bait me is, is they say, well, look at The regulations require a manufacturer to go to Health Canada in their license application and actually provide evidence that supports their claim. Like, that protects people against fraud. I mean, you don't support that? Right? Like, you see how you can be baited with that, right? And, I mean, that sounds wonderful, right? It really sounds wonderful. But you know what happens in real life is, and I, I've gotten the calls from the, the doctors and the naturopaths, is that there'll be a, a natural product that people have been taking for 100 years, well-established, and it, it manages a serious condition. And in Canada, and this is happening almost daily, so we'll have a product that medical doctors are using, 
naturopaths are using, TCMs. You might, they might be, you know, across Canada, there could be 50 to 100,000 people on this product being managed by health professionals successfully. And then the product license application lands on the desk of some 20-year-old science grad in Health Canada. No medical training, not a friggin' idea what the product's used for and that people are relying on it and that doctors and natural health practitioners are using it. That little science grad with no medical training will look at the application and go, well, I'm not satisfied in the evidence in this application that the claim supported, so I refuse the application. And then the manufacturer has to take it off the market. And then I get calls from doctors and patients going, what the heck do I do? And I got a problem with that. And philosophically, I have a problem because then it means that the government is saying that you do not have the right to take a medication that we don't approve. See, and I'm all for, you know, if the government doesn't approve something, that you have to know it's not approved and you have to know their objections or whatever. But isn't there a problem when you can't ever, as a sovereign individual, choose to take something that you need? Like, you know, with this E-Empower Plus example, it was actually based on pig research. Like, where it came from is the one founder, Tony Stefan, his wife had bipolar, she committed suicide. Two of his kids, you know, his oldest daughter was involuntarily committed to psych wards probably half of each year. His oldest son, Joseph, was raging. The kid was about 230 pounds. He was going to have to be institutionalized. This man is broken, and he just starts sharing his pain with David Hardy, who was an animal nutritionist. And Mr. Hardy said to him, he said, um, you know, I don't know anything about humans, but this rage you're describing in Joseph, it sure sounds like what we see in pigs with ear and tail biting. And when we see it in pigs, we know there's a nutritional deficiency, we supplement their feed, and 100% of the time the behavior goes away and the little light bulbs go off. I wonder if there's a nutritional basis to bipolar disorder, and they come up with the product. Now, when people started it, everyone knew this is just based on pig research. It's just vitamins and minerals, but nobody was deceived. Is there anything wrong with us trying something when all the approved things don't work? It's just, it's, it's an interesting philosophical question. And if we take products away that people rely on, are we not causing a health risk? See, and that's why I say what we're doing is absolutely fundamentally dangerous. And the bias in Health Canada is really something. Because I think everyone in this room, you know, if I say, do you know what, chemical pharmaceuticals carry quite a risk. I mean, that's very easy to accept. Every risk analysis, it's mainstream media now. I was giving a lecture in Vancouver last year, and, you know, Vancouver Sun had, they had tracked how many emergency ward um, admissions were caused by adverse drug reactions. It was over half, like over a, a period of time. Uh, Professor Ron Law from New Zealand, who's a risk analysis person, did a risk analysis using Canadian government statistics to show what are the leading causes of death in Canada in various age groups. And I had assumed before I saw his risk analysis that, you know, as a young person, that the biggest risk was a car accident, right? Because I've heard that before. No, the biggest risk in every age group except one is taking a chemical pharmaceutical drug. I didn't know that based on Canadian government statistics. I thought it was a car ride. But no, you're better off when you're taking your kids to the doctor if you get in a car accident and can't show up. I mean, it's, it's, and I'm not here to knock doctors. I've got some wonderful doctors. I have taken chemical pharmaceutical drugs. I expect I will again. I'm not here to knock that. But I have a problem when the government says, well, we're going to take natural remedies away and force you to that model so you don't have any choice. And then we're going to pretend that forcing us onto the into the chemical model doesn't carry a risk. It carries a risk. Why don't we just admit it? I mean, there's room for regulation. I'm just saying we're not doing this right. We're actually causing harm. And Health Canada's bias towards pharmaceuticals is it's astounding. I mean, it shows up in the recall policy. And like, often people will write to Health Canada or email them and complain about losing products. And Health Canada responds. And sometimes people send me their responses. And what I noticed um, in about the last year and a half is Health Canada has started to brag about how many recalls of natural products they've forced. 
And uh, like it's over 250 now. And so Health Canada will write back and say, you know, we've forced 253 products off the market through recalls. And some of them are for single up natural products. I don't know what the number is now, but, you know, when I, it first came to my attention, we were under 300, kind of around 250. Um, and they'll use words like, and some of these recalls were called because there could have been potentially serious adverse reactions, which I just, you know, chuckle about. Well, <clears throat> and here's the bias. Let's say that Health Canada just said to themselves, you know what, for an entire year, we don't care what type of product it is, chemical, natural, we don't care. If a product causes a single death, we're going to recall it. We're going to recall that product. So, and they enforce it for a year. Now, after a year, how many natural health products would they have recalled? None. Well, none, exactly. I mean, unless something really weird has happened. Now, and, but it kind of begs the question, after a year, would there be any chemical pharmaceuticals still left on the market? Like, even the over-counter cold mega, uh, medicines for kids and stuff like that, they cause deaths every year. The simple uh, painkillers, they cause deaths every year. Like, I, I was trying to think, like, maybe Vicks Vapor Rub would still be on the market. Like, I don't know. But do you see the, do you see the bias there? It's absolutely, absolutely outstanding. So, <clears throat> we're losing... We're losing our rights. We're losing our freedoms. The government is taking away, you know, your right to choose what to eat, your right to choose how you're going to treat yourself. And I want to read you a quote from Thomas Jefferson. I'm going to read it to you twice because it's just so good. I want it to sink in. I want you to think about it. I want you to ask yourself, do I agree with this? Do I disagree? Thomas Jefferson wrote, if we allow the government to tell us what food to eat or medicine to take, we are subjecting ourselves to the worst form of tyranny. I'm going to read that again. So Thomas Jefferson said, if we allow the government to tell us what food to eat or medicine to take, we are subjecting ourselves to the worst form of tyranny. It's pretty self-evident because if the government is controlling what's happening to your very body, what do you have left? I mean, isn't that total slavery? I think he's right. And so it kind of raises the question then. Because we're allowing the government to tell us what food to eat. We're allowing the courts to tell us we don't have any right to decide what food to eat. We're allowing the government to tell us what medications we can take. We're in the process of losing our, our right to choose. That's happening now. We're allowing it. And so we are, if you agree with Thomas Jefferson, we're subjecting ourselves to the worst form of tyranny. Why? Why do we love slavery? See why that was such an important question? Because we are doing nothing. We'll Will my, I, I've got three kids, my youngest is 14. They'll understand what the rule of law was. But will my grandkids even understand what the rule of law was? Will they even understand, you know, why the older generations primarily are upset about what we're allowing to happen? See, I think the generations ahead of us wouldn't have allowed this to happen. They used to fight wars. They used to die. They used to stand up for the rule of law. But our generation, us right now that are in control, we're allowing this to happen. We're allowing it to happen. And, um, and we're becoming socialized to have no privacy, to accept, you know, police intrusion after intrusion after intrusion. I mean, how many here, um, how many remember that the older generations used to be outraged about police stops? Like, we expect them now on New Year's Eve. We expect them, you know, on Christmas Eve, you know, road safe things. I find now that, at least in BC, sometimes on non holidays, just middle of the day, we're getting stopped at roadblocks and police are checking every car. But in earlier generations, that used to be police state stuff. You didn't allow that to happen in free societies. But we become conditioned, no, it's okay. And first it was just on holidays for drunk driving, and now it's not on holidays, and we're going to see more and more. 
And now, you know, I don't have to buy flowers and chocolates. I get my genitals groped. All I have to do is fly. Like, we are being socialized to be controlled. And we're allowing it to happen. And I promise you, if you don't become active, when you're on your deathbed and you're doing your little life review before you actually have your real life review, you're going to regret what you've passed on to the next generation. Because you are loving slavery. There were very few hands that went up, and I didn't even ask, okay, well, how many was it more than one letter? How many was it more than one meeting? You know what I mean? Most of us are doing nothing, and this is absolutely very serious. Some of us are going to be in the position, I promise you, where either us or somebody we care for is going to need one of these treatments that is being taken away, and it's going to be gone, and it's going to be personal, and you're going to regret it. We have to become active. I need you to do a couple of things, and then I'll wrap up. I need you to educate yourself about the Charter of Health Freedom. Just Google Charter of Health Freedom. And it, it has its own website, just www.charterofhealthfreedom.org. Bunch of groups across Canada got together and asked, how do we protect our health rights? And they came up with the Charter of Health Freedom. The Charter basically takes the health rights the courts say we have, it puts it into a law that compels the government to honor them. The court can't say they're not there. Can't be any standing issues. It creates a new ministry, the Ministry of Wellness, to protect and promote our access. And being that, we tend not to have standing in courts. This has become important. It creates a health freedom ombudsman. So if you have lost medication, you rely on at least the ombudsman can use the media to shame the government to get your, your medication back. So the charter has become extremely important. We are, we're in a petition drive. You can, on the website, download a petition and print it off. There's instructions on the bottom of where to send it once you've got the signatures. We're at 83,000 now, which is the third largest federal petition, I think, in the last decade. We actually want to get the more, most signatures in, in history for a federal petition. We got a, a ways to go yet, but become involved in the charter initiative. It's actually, uh, it's, <clears throat> it's a solution. It's the only solution I'm aware of that's going to work. Also, get active. I mean, I, I'm part of a group called the Natural Health Products Protection Association. Our website is www.nhppa. <clears throat> you can go onto our site, and there's a, a place where you can give us your email address. Now, what we do is we put, you know, when an issue comes up, we put together kits so that you know what to say to your MP, so you know how to draft a letter. So, you know, we basically help, we'll train you to become an activist. We, we do these kits as these issues come up. And, but also we have, you know, alerts. So, for example, when this Consumer Product Safety Act, when it was working its way through the Senate the second time, it had already passed in the House, we sent out alert <clears throat> right to the Senate so that they call witnesses that oppose the thing. The witnesses got called and it got stopped for a while, like it works. But how can you know what to do and be plugged in? You know, you've got to plug into groups like the NHPPA, and you also have to support us financially. Because you know the truth is, I mean, I had to fly out here. I have to eat while I'm here. It costs money for us to educate, put these packages together, to come and lecture, stuff like that. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. And, you know, some people think, oh, well, I can write the odd letter, I can have the odd meeting, and that's okay. You're not going to be equipped. You're not going to know about the issues. You're not going to know what to do unless you support groups. It doesn't have to be my group. But you actually, if you, you actually, if you want to make a difference, have to start supporting these health freedom groups with your finances and, and your time. So I need you to become active. I need you to stop loving slavery because when you think about it logically, it's true. You know what's happening. You didn't have to hear me lecture it. You know what's happening. You know you're not doing anything. And if you don't start doing anything, it's this, you know, the bus is going to keep going and we're going to have no freedoms at all.